start with a um, shout out to my uh, my co-authors here, and especially to to Jada for that, uh, that lovely talk, which sets up very nicely um, what I'm about to say. There'll be some repetition, but uh, I'll try and keep that to a minimum. Um, and uh, you know, you might almost think we'd planned it. Um, okay, so um, why are we studying Nurosk? Well, this is clearly this this diagram is completely self-explanatory. Nurosk is is right out here at the end of the scale in terms of um, resource endowment for for PGEs, nickel and copper. Um, there's over a trillion dollars in present value in contained metals in the Nurosk Talnat camp, um, and the Oktobriski Timirski um, deposit by itself, one single ore body, is probably the single most valuable accumulation of metals of any ore deposit type anywhere in the planet. So it'd be nice to find more of these things. Um, so um, why am I talking about new concept? Well, to talk about new concepts, I need to sort of you know, tell you what the old concept was. Um, and this is the um, this is what I call the reaction cell, the conduit model, which is the which has been sort of the the fundamental working paradigm for understanding um, these types of intrusion hosted nickel deposits for for for, for many years now, really going back to um, in, uh, Tony Noldrit and and and, and earlier. Um, and the idea is that we have the, the 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 intrusion system is a sort of a passive conduit. It's just the container, it's the pipe in which everything happens. We're, we're pumping our mineralizing fluid, which in this case obviously is a magma. We're pumping that in at the inflow end. It's flowing through flowing through a tube, flowing out the other end. Um, and uh, it, it's interacting with country rock to assimilate and incorporate sulfide. Um, that uh, re results in also crystallization of silicate phases, usually olivine. Um, and then the sulfide drops out in some sort of pre-existing mechanical trap site, sort of like um, heavy minerals being collected downstream of boulders. Um, and then the, the contaminated and now PGE depleted magma flows out the other end. And that's a it's a very sort of simple and attractive model. And this has really been sort of what we've. Uh, been guided by for for many years, um, but I think that for, for for many reasons it's time to actually sort of move on and 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 refine this model. And I'll show you some of the reasons why I think that. But the main one, and the one which I'll just ask you to take my word for, because I I don't have time to go into the details. There's a substantial mismatch between the time scales for the component processes here. Um, and uh, Yao alluded to that really nicely in his talk yesterday, that the time it takes to actually assimilate the sulfide, react it with the magma, is way, way longer than the time it would take that sulfide just to drop out of the magma. Um, and there, there are a whole lot of other um, sort of you know, comparable uh, comparable problems and paradoxes which make this, this simplistic kind of model not realistic. It's, this isn't the way the ore deposits form. Um, so now let's see how that um, how we can maybe answer some of those problems in relation to Norilsk. So um, here we go. You've all, all seen this map. You all know where, where, where we're talking about. Um, we're um, the Siberian traps, Permian-Triassic boundary. Um, these uh, massive effusion of, of, of mafic volcanic rocks is about 2 million cubic kilometers. Um, and the bit which is exactly coeval with the ore deposits is also exactly coeval with the largest mass extinction in planetary history. That's the Permian-Triassic extinction, They're exactly coincident within 100,000 years. Um, and the ore deposits themselves are associated with these very particular types of intrusions, very unusual type of intrusion. Um, and they all fall along this big um, translithospheric fault, the neuros Taralac fault. Um, and the intrusions themselves that host the mineralization are tiny, um, roughly order of magnitude. They represent about a millionth of the volume of the Siberian traps magnetism. So the ultimate needle in a haystack. Um, and the other important thing to say is that these are subvolcanic intrusions. They're in place very shallow in the crust, somewhere between about 500 meters and two kilometers, um, which is relatively unusual. Most of the nickel deposits we know are, are, are deeper than that. Um, so uh, Jada showed this cross section. That's the that's the Karolak intrusion there. Um, and uh, these intrusions are all in place within a thick sequence of very, very juicy late Paleozoic sediments, um, and which includes lots of lots of things like lots of evaporites, um, halites, um, lots of uh, black shales. Um, lots of really sort of good, juicy, reactive country rocks. Um, and also, this sequence is dripping with hydrocarbons. There's lots of oil and gas and stuff in here. Um, and the top of it is actually um, Russia's largest coal basin. So this extraordinary combination of lots of sulfate-rich rocks and lots of carbon-rich rocks within this uh, stratigraphic sequence. Okay, so onto the intrusions themselves. Um, and uh, now, for a long time, we've had this conduit model for the Norilsk intrusions. Um, and for, 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 for longer than that, the local Russian geologists have been telling us, no, that's not actually what these things really are. Um, this, is a, this, this is a more realistic model. They're not flow through intrusions. They have what are called frontal portions where the intrusions actually break up 
into lots of little small fingers and sills and, uh, and, and, and uh, little sort of apophyses. Um, and um, in fact, a really nice example of this type of geometry was given in Ben Cave's excellent talk yesterday on Nova, which is a beautiful example of the geometry of, of one of these things. They're exactly the same in terms of their geometry, which is intriguing because the Nova one was in place 20 kilometers in the, down in the crust. So there's something really fundamental about sort of mechanics of intrusions, which is independent of pressure, it seems. Um, anyway, so to go on and talk a bit more about this, um, it, it, so the intrusions are classic, uh, classic chonoliths, say that fast, um, but not open-ended conduits. Um, they have um, olivine spinel sulfide rocks at the tops and bottoms, um, broadly olivine poor rocks in the middle, and the rocks in the middle are much less contaminated. So that's that's one important constraint, bear that in mind. Um, and that's the, the, the best thing I can find is sort of analog for the shape of these kinds of things. So these these horrible socks with toes, so they're, all, they're awful things. But that, that's what these things look like to my, to, to my mind. They break up into these little little, little toes at the end. Um, okay. Um, so as Jada mentioned, this, this issue of the, 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 this thermal, or supposedly thermal aureole around the intrusions, there's this huge influence of, of, of hydrothermal fluid interaction with the rocks. They're not really thermal aureoles, they're metasomatic fluid aureoles. Um, and they're, they're manifest in a whole variety of different ore types, lots of, lots of uh, uh, breccia types, um, infiltration ores, um, scarn type ores. Um, the country rocks are very heavily brecciated. There's huge evidence for vast volumes of hydrothermal fluid um, interacting with the country rocks at a scale comparable to the intrusions themselves. So uh, hundreds of meters away from the intrusions. And that's far more than could be explained by just a simple thermal aureole. Um, okay, okay, so um, now let's move on to um, this uh, sort of key, key part, this sort of key line of evidence, and that's the presence of these globular ores. Um, and we find those um, down towards the bottom of the intrusion. Um, at, at, right, right at the very bottom, we get these um, things called taxitic rocks. These are basically contaminated, highly variable textured gabbros and, and, and olivine gabbros with lots of partially digested country rock fragments in them. Um, and at the bottom, we get these big sulfide globules and look like this. Um, and we'll, uh, th these are the ones which are typically differentiated with copper rich tops and uh, copper poor bottoms. Um, that's a, that's a uh, just need to fix my um, laser pointer, sorry. Um, so, and, and here you see that this is a, a lump of sort of par partially remelted um, and uh, recrystallized argillite, probably lots of this kind of stuff floating through them. Um, okay, so um, brief digression, Judd already touched on this, so I'll really just, uh, just amplifying a little bit on it. Um, this is a sort of flow di uh, phase diagram for sulfide droplet behavior, which uh, Jesse Robertson came up with. Um, this is sort of a simplified version of what's in the paper. Um, so there's two axes here. Um, the, the, the vertical axis here is flow regime going all the way from stagnant magma up the, all the way up to turbulent flowing magma. That's the Rayleigh number increasing going up that way. Um, and the droplet radius over here going from microns to meters out this way. Um, and there's several sort of regions of behavior here. Um, the first one being the, the region within which droplets are transported. And that's a, that's a small droplets in rapidly flowing magma. Very easy to transport. Very small droplets have a very high surface energies. So they don't deform very easily. So they're, 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 they're transported around with, with the greatest of ease. Um, if you make them a bit bigger, then droplet settling becomes, they start to feel gravity. Droplet settling becomes substantially important. Um, up, in the, uh, up at the top here, we've got a droplet death zone. Um, and this is where the droplets start to get ripped apart, either by due to turbulence or due to um, sh uh, stretching and uh, stretching and um, oh, sorry, I forget the words gone. But anyway, they break up. Um, and over on the right hand side, there, big big droplets will 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 pull themselves apart just uh, just under gravity as they're, as, as they're sinking. Um, and there's a little zone here um, where you have low um, flow velocities or stagnant magma um, and large droplets. And this is the regime within which droplets will coalesce and get bigger. Um, and the real takeaway from this one is that droplets this size, even if you allow for the fact they might have a bit of vapor attached to them, are too big to have been transported. So these things must have been generated very, very close to where we actually find them. They must have been generated actually within the intrusions. So that's, that's, that's the takeaway point from there. 
Um, and again, just emphasizing this one, can droplets coalesce during transport? Well, the fluid dynamics basically so it's very unlikely that they do. So, so we've got to have a mechanism of getting a fi finely dispersed sort of mist of droplets out of a magma, turning them into big ones um, and segregating them. And uh, Chara already um, gave us, a, gave us a, 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 the, the, the clue there in her talk, which is to do with, with, with um, bubble harvesting, essentially. Um, so um, next bit. So now let's just have a little bit more of a, a, a look at these things. Um, and um, these uh, globular sulfides with these uh, silica caps attached to them. These are universal within, the, within, within these rocks. This is a synchrotron XFM image, chrome ion calcium map. Um, and here's a, uh, or another feature here that uh, the reason I put this one in, very commonly in these uh, picritic rocks with the sulfides in them, there's de quite a bit of dendritic olivine. Um, so in, in some cases, it's, all, it's, it's beautifully harasitic. In some rare cases, it's almost spinifex textured, but it's ubiquitous in these rocks. Um, that tells you this olivine is crystallizing from a super cooled liquid. Okay, here's, a, here's some of the silicate caps. Um, there's one wrapped around a sulfide. That's, that's a sort of, it was just intersected at the top of one and just, just really barely grazed the top of the sulfide. What's in these things? Um, well, you can see here, basically, they, they're occupying spherical voids in the olivine crystal framework. So I think this, this crystal framework was essentially a rigid, um, sort of a rigid cage, and the sulfides are sitting within these holes. The holes are vapor bubbles, um, and these spaces have now filled in with the residual fractionated products of the trapped liquid. Um, so, you, so what you get is the, the I should, uh, sorry, I should have pointed out in this one here. Um, these are clinoperoxines. Um, and they're really strongly zoned. So they've got chromium rich cores, they've got chromium poor titanium rich margins. So that's what that color variation is showing you. Um, and here's the same thing. So these things grow into the edges of these silicate caps. So clearly what's happening is the silicate melt is being pushed into the, the residual vapor, uh, re residual space left by the vapor bubbles. Um, and this is a well-known phenomenon in volcanic rocks. They're called segregation vesicles. They're widespread in basalts. Um, and um, if you want to read a little bit more about them, um, then um, we, well, this is in our 2019 paper where we go into the, the mechanism. But one important aspect of this, and one of the ways I think of, of, of making these textures so well developed at Norilsk is that you have a pressure increase after the accumulation of the drobbles. There's a pressure increase afterwards, and that's what causes this silicate melt to migrate into the drobbles. So, so bear that one in mind. We'll come back to that. So here we go. Meet the, you've already met the drobble, so I don't, don't need to introduce you. Here's a really nice one frozen into the upper margin of one of the intrusions. Um, and in this case, this is a classic Amingdale. This is just filled in with, with low temperature hydrothermal um, phases, zeolites and clay minerals and, and carbonate and what, what have you. Um, so what, we, what we're looking at here is the accumulation of these uh, vapor bubble sulfide droplet pairs. All right, so now let's go to the um, to the, the, the upper series rocks. And uh, Ivan Cheka gave a really beautiful description of these yesterday, which is great. I don't need to, I went, 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 yesterday, day before. Anyway, in the PGE deposit session, um, we have a really nice account of these rocks. So I'll just show you, a, 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 sort of recap that, just show you a couple of features that, 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 that we found. So this is um, a, another synchrotron XRF map, another chrome ion calcium map. And what you see here are these, these peculiar sort of rafts and schlieren and blobs of, of chromatite, which develop in the, the upper zones of the intrusions, upper, where you've got contact with these uh, um, very highly brecciated country rocks, lots of assimilation, um, lots of fluid interactions. Um, and, in the, in, in, and in the upper rocks, in the upper few meters, you get these things. Um, so here we've got, this is basically a contaminated gabbronorite with a little bit of olivine in it here and there. Um, these are these chrome spinel mats, very variable spinel chemistry, which you can see in the colors there. Um, and these things are amygdales, they're gas bubbles, and they're full of um, hydrous, in this case, some residual trapped liquid, not so much. These are mostly just voids filled with, with, with low temperature hydrothermal minerals, um, and they're the sulfides. Um, and uh, this is a beautiful example. Um, this is a, a, a quite a famous sample, which came to us by way of Dima Kamenetsky um, uh, to do a little bit of microtomography on it. So these things are basically bubble foams. So um, and what they show here is that the, the oxide minerals, and these are these are mainly chrome spinels, um, love to coat the outsides of the love to coat the outsides of the droplets. It's like a classic kind of froth flotation cell product with the oxide sticking to the outside. So what we've got here is this mechanical interaction between gas bubbles, silicate melt, sulfide melt, and, and, and oxide minerals. So it's really quite quite extraordinary. And you can see here these things form these beautiful spherical shells. 
Um, and as it happened, we, while we were collecting these images, literally as we were actually sitting at the synchrotron watching these images come in, um, a paper landed in my inbox, and it was this one, Pleche et al., um, who'd done some experiments where they'd generated oxide shells around gas bubbles. And th this is what their, theirs looked like in 3D. These are experimental ones, and this is what ours looked like in 3D in the rocks. So uh, that, was a, that was a bit of a signal that, uh, oh, you must be onto something here. Okay, so basically we're looking at a process of froth flotation. Um, all right, next bit, um, and again, this is, uh, Jada alluded to this um, in her talk, just to build on it a little bit. This is another one of these synchrotron images, and what I've done here is I've uh, enhanced the sulfide, so there's the sulfide in this sort of purpley color. Here's where all the platinum minerals are. Um, and what you see is that there's some association of platinum minerals with the sulfide, but most of the platinum minerals are actually in the chromite rafts. Um, and in most cases, those are actually still associated with little tiny amounts of sulfide, but not all of them. So a lot of these are actually platinum grains, which is completely decoupled from the sulfide. So the platinum and the sulfides are associated at a sort of tens of centimeter scale, but it, at, at, this sort of, at this grain scale, they're not. Um, and what that is due to, as we've heard, this is due to degassing of the sulfide um, and precipitation of platinum minerals. And uh, you saw that, that beautiful image in Jada's talk of a little platinum mineral um, that was attached to um, that was attached to an olivine grain. In this case, they're attached to, to chromite grains. Um, and that compares with the platinum distribution in the typical globular ores here, where you can see the platinum minerals are all beautifully located right, right around the edge of these sulfide globules, always 100% associated with sulfide. So that's the evidence of sulfur degassing and platinum mineral formation. Okay, story so far. So the sulfide globules are attached to vapor bubbles of widely variable size and proportion. Um, the drobbles in the roof zone form from low, form the high, low sulfur high PGU ores due to sulfur degassing. Um, the droplets are too big to have been transported very far. Uh, the magnets were degassing while the ore bodies were forming. Okay, so now we need to consider where and how the sulfide liquid was being generated. Um, so back to this stratigraphic column again, and just a reminder about this association with anhydrite and carbonaceous rocks. Um, and this has been known for many, many years, since, at least since the 1960s, um, when people started doing sulfur isotopes, the, the, the ore deposits at Norilsk have massively heavy sulfur. Um, the unmineralized intrusions have slightly heavy sulfur, but it's but, but, but much lower. And um, the, the, these heavy numbers here can really only come from evaporite and assimilation. So you know, here's an interesting thing. This is a new paper that just came out this year. Um, and Marina, who's a co-author on this, was also a co-author on that. Um, the sulfur isotropic compositions actually vary spatially within the ore bodies. This is, this is the Karolak intrusion. This is the octobriski timirsky system here. Um, and the sulfur gets heavier as you get towards the frontal end. This, the, the, the toes of the sock, if you like, out here has the, has the heaviest sulfur in the ore bodies. It's a really intriguing observation. So here's the smoking gun. Here's a couple of samples of massive sulfide ores. And these things in here are bladed anhydrite. Um, this, is, this is a photo I took in the courtyard at, a, at a, a, a one of the, the Talnac mines. Um, and this is a, a, a sample that was, uh, or a picture that was sent to me by Marina. Um, and uh, these, these, are, these are carbon fragments, coal fragments associated with the anhydrite and the sulfide ore. So absolute, you know, clear smoking gun evidence. There's no doubt this is where the sulfur is coming from. But if the sulfur comes from the evaporites, then it was assimilated as sulfate. Um, S6 plus is much more soluble in mafic magma than sulfur 2 plus. We know that from uh, Pedro Hugo's um, classic experiments in 2005. There's an order of magnitude difference between sulfate and sulfide solubility. So to get the sulfide out, if you're assimilating anhydrite, you've got to reduce it. Um, and that's where um, Jada's experiments come in. This is the 2017 paper. Um, a coupled assimilation of anhydrite um, together with carbonaceous material um, generates sulfide liquids. Um, not only does it generate sulfide liquids, but lo and behold, it also generates drobbles. So this is this is a really key part of the story here. All right, so now the next bit, the next sort of constraint on the story here, and this is again something else which we've known about for a long time. The total mass of platinum and palladium in the ore bodies is way greater than can be explained by the, the volume of the intrusions. Um, and um, we can argue um, about what, the, what that ratio actually is. Tony Noldrop reckons it was about 200. Um, depending on how you, 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 you crunch the numbers, you can get lower numbers. Um, but I think we can say confidently that you need at least 10 times the amount of magma that, uh, the, the, relative to the volume of the intrusions that we find the ore deposits in. So we must have been generating our sulfide liquid 
um, as, as fine droplets because of that mechanical constraint within the magma column before injection into the cells. Now, whether that was happening in a cell dike complex, um, I like the, the, the idea of these sort of interconnected cell dike networks that uh, Craig McGee talks about. I think that's, that's, that's a more realistic sort of interpretation than, than having some big sort of mysterious magma chamber down below, but we just don't know. There's some pre-existing um, magma volume where, where, where we have these uh, finely dispersed sulfide droplets that we're transporting. Um, now we've got to harvest them. And this is the, this, this is the key point from, from Jada's talk and the Jada's experiments. Well, a great way of actually harvesting up these fine sulfide droplets and making big ones um, is by this mechanism of generating more vapor phase. These big vapor bubbles collect up the sulfide droplets. Once you've got them sitting side by side, they'll very happily coalesce with one another um, and form bigger ones. So this is what we call um, harvesting of droplets by vapor bubbles. So, um, so let's just you know, take the next st the story a little bit further. Most of the mass of sulfides made pre-intrusion um, as a result of this anhydrite plus carbonaceous material assimilation. The magmas were degassing while the ore bodies were forming for all, all these various lines of evidence we've talked about. Those are some more of those beautiful dendritic olivines that we find within the, uh, the picritic rocks. Um, vapor bubbles can harvest the droplets, but we want this to happen in the intrusions, not before. We want this to happen associated with the intrusion formation. So that implies we've got two stages of vapor phase generation. Um, just checking how I'm doing for time here. Yeah. So now th this is sort of the, I think the, the 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 crucial sort of final piece of this jigsaw puzzle. And this is a a, a very nice paper that came out a few years ago by Jeanette Kavanagh, um, Sandy Pruden, um, and what what they they were looking at the um, stress regime associated with the transition between sills and dikes. And this is a this is an analog experiment. Sandy's done lots of these kinds of experiments. Um, this, so this represents, a, this, this is an analog experiment using gelatine. Um, this is a, is a dike representing overpressured magma coming up through the crust, hits some sort of interface here um, and propagates as a sill. That's sort of long on, that's, that's kind of a side on view. Um, and uh, what they did in these experiments was, to, was to, to, to image this strain and stress fields associated with this transition. And what they found was that sill inception is accompanied by a rapid 50% drop in the horizontal finite strain um, associated with the propagation of the magma along a horizontal surface. Um, and what this means is that, that this scales to a stress drop in the magma, um, a pressure drop in the magma from about 250 to about 100 megapascals. In other words, there's a big, if you've got an overpressured magma, you'll have a sudden pressure drop associated with the formation of the sill. Okay, what's that going to do? If that magma is already volatile saturated, what that's going to do is to generate a huge exolution of magmatic vapor. Um, so you're going to get a transient massive increase in the overpressure due to that vapor phase exolution um, accompanying, accompanying that in, injection of the sill. Now, that, that pressure change is way more than you need to crack rocks. So this could be what actually drives the explosive injection of magma into the chonoliths, fracturing of the country rocks, and all of these other features that we're seeing. Um, the other thing that could very well be happening is if you, if you can open fractures all the way to the surface, then you'll get a rapid transient change from a lithostatic pressure to a hydrostatic pressure. That's a massive pressure drop, and that will reinforce this same process. That will reinforce exolution of huge amounts of magmatic volatiles. Okay, so this is the, this is the story we've, we've, we've got sort of in relation to that. So here's a, here's a, a sort of a cross-section or a plan view of, a, of how the, um, these chonoliths might be forming. <laughs> um, explosive volatile release. This leads to the coalescence and harvesting of small entrained droplets. We form these big, um, big, big bubbles that collect up our droplets and turn them into turn little ones into big ones. Explosive fragmentation, rapid assimilation of country rocks, giving all these taxite breccia scarn features. Um, deposition of the of, of the droplets, um, and this is sort of a cartoon view of how we think it might be happening. Um, and the other cool thing that could be happening here is a, 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 a um, sort of a differentiation of the droplets according to the ratio of, of vapor to sulfide. So the ones with lots of sulfide, not much vapor are gonna sink. When they sink, the volume of the vapor bubble decreases. Um, the ones up at the top here, lots of vapor, not much sulfide, those ones float up to the top and the opposite happens. So that's a kind of a reinforcing process. Um, so these, these things are now, the, the, these are now the low PG sulfur ores and, um, and things at the bottom are the classic globular ores. Um, and that material also accumulates on the bottom to form the massive sulfide ores. Those massive sulfide ores we know the mobility of sulfide liquid is, is very, very high. It'll happily exploit all of those fractures that are made by that initial stage of hydrofracturing. Um, and that's what forms all these complicated country rock ores. 
Um, so the result of that is this progression of, uh, of sulfide textures um, that, uh, that we see. Um, one other possible um, uh, uh, sort of corollary to this is as, as this process continues, if we now start to flush this system out with less contaminated magma, perhaps that's the stage at which we start to modify the sulfur isotopic composition by washing out the original heavy sulfur signal and re-equilibrating with a, with a more normal mantle-like magma. And perhaps what, that's what we're seeing in this spatial signal of sulfur isotopes. Um, so um, neuros magmas were... So anyway, I don't need to say all that again. I've said it all before, but that's, that's basically sort of the the model that we see. How am I going? Right, um, I, sh I, sh I should shut up. Um, so I will I will leave that bit out, and we'll just go straight to um, straight to the conclusion side. And I will show you. And I'd just like to show you this. If I can get this to work. Oh no, I can't get this to work. Steve, you've got to take the laser the video. Oh, uh, turn it off. Yeah. Oh, okay. Aha, there we go. Um, so, right, so there we go. There's the conclusions, and I'll leave you with this um, uh, little recipe for uh, making a Nareil score body in the comfort of your own kitchen. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I agree with you. I think uh, by the moment, I, I just see. Mm -hmm. yeah, so many questions. Uh, first, uh, from the study, uh, Nadia's study on the melting inclusion. Yeah. And uh, this suggests that the, the parent magma is water poor. The water condition is less, maybe 0 0.6 weight percent. So I think it's a little difficult to form, to, to form the bubble that in the uh, deep magma chamber. And then also dirtying the ascent of the magma in the conduit. Because, yeah, the pressure is decreased, but the, this over magma over pressure decrease is, is to overcome the gravity and overcome the viscosity flow. So I think uh, the most important thing is because when your magma injection in the sedimentary, the sedimentary may be unconsolidated. So the magma will hitting the cell sediment. And because there's heating the sediment, and the sedimentary maybe contains so many bubbles, and it will get the heat, it will uh, quickly expand, and the, the bubble will go into the cell. But if this model is okay, but there is another question is that it's very quick process. So it's very difficult to think when the bubble uh, enter into the magma, but at the same time, uh, the dissolution of the sulf sulfide maybe a long time to occur the dissolution of the sulfide to aid the sulfide, aid the sulfur from the sulfide into the system. So I think that this may be the accumulation of the sulfide may be in the deep magma chamber. Okay, so um, well, there's a lot there. I'm not sure where to start answering that, but just, um, just what, one point there, the sediments were not unconsolidated. The sediments are 100 million years older than the intrusions. These, they, were, they were solid rocks when this stuff came in. Um, so there, 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 there might have been there, there might have been liquid hydrocarbons in the system, but the, but the country rocks were definitely not unconsolidated. They were they were solid rocks. They're old rocks at this time. They're upper Devonian yeah, or lower lower Devonian in the Karolak case. Um, so um, yeah, there's a lot else there. Um, the the fluid inclusion evidence. I mean, I think the problem with that is. We, we don't know how much of this olivine is transported into the in, into the intrusions. So we've, we've made a case that a lot of it's growing in place, but it doesn't all have to be. Um, so some of those fluid inclusions could be recording the magma pre-contamination. I think that's probably what's going on. Um, that the, and, and the pre-contamination magma is a it's a Morangovsky standard, um, you know, eight percent tholeite with very little water. Um, and it's only when you get all of this assimilation of, of particularly the argillaceous material that it gets volatile rich. So I'm not sure what those fluid inclusions are really telling us, but I, I wouldn't want to try and I'm not familiar enough with the detail to want to to want to argue that one. But the country rocks were definitely not unconsolidated. I think we're gonna to have to move on. I do apologize, but just so the next speaker is Maria Shadantsova from the University of Western Australia. <clears throat> Yeah, welcome. Can I 